And we're going to be talking today about addiction. Piero is a clinical therapist, a mentor, a coach, a recovery addict, a facilitator, and a professional speaker. And he's got a personal story. And of course, he has also been helping a lot of people to uh, recover from addiction, different types of addictions. But today we're going to be diving into it, not only about how you get addicted, but also the uh, consequences of uh, being addicted to something. And, and of course, uh, a few uh, tools that you can utilize uh, to potentially start on your journey to getting rid of your addiction. Uh, hi, Piero. How are you? I'm well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, thank you so much for your time and for uh, being here with us. It is, uh, I believe, a very important subject. And when yesterday we were talking a little bit off camera about, you know, how we would start this uh, conversation, it was really interesting because um, addiction can cover so many different things. And I see that, you know, in a world uh, where there are legal things and illegal things, it's very easy to be addicted to uh, legal things. Uh, or things that we can easily access to, like, for example, on all social media, uh, you know, the addiction to scrolling and spending hours on social media, and our addiction to alcohol. Again, you know, you can just go and buy alcohol anywhere. Uh, so I think it's important for each person that are listening to this to uh, potentially see an addiction something that you have an unhealthy relationship with a particular thing that you are doing that it's not benefiting you. Um, what do you think about that, Piero? How, what are your um, views on kind of the definition of addiction? That's a, that's a really great question. Uh, and I've crafted my own definition uh, of addiction. And that is, I believe that an addiction is an uncontrollable obsession to either giving or getting attention to or from something or someone. Wow. Yeah, that's that's. That's very powerful, yeah. So tell us a little bit about your journey on how you realized that yeah, you were addicted uh, and you had this uncontrollable uh, you know, desire to get the attention uh, or whatever you were seeking to at a time. Yeah, that, look, once again, this is, you know, delving into life itself, right? And this is where our story is our message to the world. So- mm -hmm. My journey really started at the age of 10. Wow. As I was tiptoeing past my father in the lounge room, he used to work late shifts. I just heard strange noises on the TV that I was unfamiliar with. And in that moment, I turned and looked at the TV and my words were gasping. I just, I, I just couldn't believe what I saw because I'd never seen it before. And in that moment, he turned to me and he said, son, don't worry about this. These are just naughty adult movies. So I just kept going, went to the toilet, went to bed. But what I heard in my mind was that naughty people were allowed to hang out together. Mm. Now, I all of a sudden went into this pitfall because majority of my upbringing as a child, all of the things that I was told was I was naughty. You're a naughty boy. You do these things. Mm. You're not allowed to do that. Naughty boys don't do those things. And naughty boys act like this and you're acting like this. These were all the things that I heard. So when I put that narrative together in my mind, I just went into this pitfall about now I've got to be good. I have to be good to the world. I have to be good to people. I have to show people that I'm not this kind of person. However, mm. there was also the narrative of naughty people can hang out together. Mm. So I wanted to understand from a curiosity point of view what it was. So obviously one day after school, and I remember this clearly, is I, I found the movies I found the videos, yeah. I put them in the tape player, uh, no one else was home, and I just started to watch it. And in that moment, I started to realize like what I now understand as the bodily sensations that I got was like uh, an erection as a child. And, and I started to understand what, like, what is, what's happening, right? And then I was obviously watching and then one thing led to another. And then I put it away and I was quite shocked by some of the things that I saw because I, I didn't understand it. I had no understanding no. of it. Mm -hmm. So that then created this narrative of no one's allowed to know. No one's allowed to know. 
I then just lived my life as a little boy. And every now and then I wanted to, I wanted to watch more of it. And I started watching more of it. And it was only when nobody was home. Sometimes I would wake up in the middle of the night and try and get away with it where I could. But then I found my father's stash of magazines. And those days, like in the early 90s, it was Penthouse, Playboy magazine and those type of things. However, some of them were table magazines like penthouse magazine featured men women cigarettes cars like it was stereotypical right okay what i started to recognize is that i needed to obviously show up one way what i now call a healthy coping mechanism so i started Mm -hmm. to show up one way and that was attention seeking behavior uh make sure that i was always seen good in people's eyes i had to show myself as some kind of like i'm i'm just doing well my life is great i've mm-hmm. I, I was egotistical and i had to get a people's attention over there and then behind the scenes whenever i felt naughty whenever i felt down in myself whenever I felt like I wasn't good enough. So when my parents would, would say, you've been naughty again, or you, you can't stay out late and you were stayed out late. And, or friends of mine would just be like, no, you can't play our games and you can't do this and you can't do that. As this continued on fast forward till about sort of 18, when I started to then delve into having a girlfriend, I hid that from her. Yeah. Because there was this, new narrative of rejection Hmm. however the calling for me was is to do good work to be good in people's Hmm. eyes so i started working i got a job straight away i i then understood that if you show up this way you're going to get rewarded Mm -hmm. so all of these other narratives that came into it then started to create a way of living, which is if you just read James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, you just mm-hmm. started to create a set of habits mm-hmm. using Sigmund Freud's defense mechanisms. And as you can see from the poster behind me, the 25 mm-hmm. uh, human behavioral cognitive biases and just living this world about how you wanted to be seen, which mm-hmm. in the therapy world, we call it a persona or a mask. Can I just go back to something that I find it really interesting? Like I'm a mother and my son is eight, eight, 11. Um, and, and I think it's really interesting. And we talked about this off camera yesterday that, you know, you saw your dad doing something and is that it's no different than, you know, somebody seeing their parents like smoking cigarettes. You know, you just take a little cigarette from your parents and because, you know, they smoke, they are not going to smell on you that you smoked or you see your dad drinking or your mom and dad drinking. You know? So you just kind of, you know, there is part of it that as a parent, like there is the, the you know, kids do what they see us doing. There is the modeling behavior, behavior that although your dad said, you know, this is naughty, you are still drawn by doing, modeling the behavior, right? And did you, on that note, did you also see your dad, uh, putting on that mask that he was very good on the outside but of course he was doing that and you knew that he was doing that and is that what you copy as well like what was the um you know when you start getting to the 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 kind of path wanting to be good to seek validation what got you because it could have been also gone to the other side I'm just going to be naughty altogether and I don't care about what the world think of me my dad worked 12 hour shifts mm. and those shifts were shift work hours. So one week it'd be day shift, one week uh, night shift and one week afternoon shift. So he was away for 12 hours at a time. And the weeks that he was home, uh, obviously I didn't see there was weeks where I wouldn't see him at all. There were times when he would be sleeping and I had to be quiet. Um, so I didn't, I didn't replicate him in lifestyle I just created a story that my dad's not around, but when he is around, I wanted to impress him. So I had to be good because part of what I was doing was because I was naughty over there and he was telling me that you're naughty. Then I started to be good over here. So I got a different form of attention from him because now I've used the movies as one form of attention for myself. Okay. Wow. That's very interesting. 
it's very interesting how our minds can take us on different places and also uh, create different realities in our own minds. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just literally created two different lives mm -hmm. in your own head. One that you could be one person and the other one that you could be another mm -hmm. person. And I think, Very. like you mentioned before, when it becomes a habit, it's kind of ingraining you. So you can talk about even how you started, but it also does become a physical and mental habit, right? And by the time you're 18, I can imagine this was very much what you did. Very. And to give that more context, by the time we're in our mid-30s, 95% of our life is already automated. Yeah. So having kind of sometimes when you start that habit at such a young age, it's almost like you didn't even have the maturity to have seen that to understand that. And again, it could be an addiction to food, right? It could be you start overeating when you were 10 or 11 uh, because of whatever reason, to get attention or to, uh, you know, to make yourself feel, uh, you know, significant or, or not. You know, there's so many different things that people can get addicted to, but at the end of the day, it just become this unconscious habit that is challenging to break, right? So... That's a very interesting question, and I'm going to delve into a little bit of addiction behavior and how habits create, obviously, those of you that have uh, read the book from James Clear. It's very straightforward. Yeah, I've read it. Yeah. However, to break it down as simple as possible, we go through a moment of pain and we move towards a moment of pleasure. Majority of addictions, when I say majority, I, I do mean substance abuse as well as neurological addictions. Now, neurological addictions are not at the same level as a substance addiction. There's actually yeah. no proof. There is actually no proof that pornography is a neurological addiction. It's just a set of habits that gives us pleasure. Now, how do you want to word that other than the way that I created my own definition of addiction? Because yes. that's what it is. So yeah. that's that's from my own belief. So when when we're when we're doing something that's challenging. When we're doing something that's challenging, it gets to a point where it becomes painful. Like, I don't want to do this anymore. And we could get up and we could do something else. We could put on music. We could turn on the TV. We could, someone could be smoking outside and we just went outside to get a breath of fresh air. Or we could be out with our friends. It could be uncomfortable. You could be 16, 14, 12. And one of your friends says, is everything okay? And it's just like, oh, I hate this. And I hate that friend. And then all of a sudden, there could be an influence of someone that says, hey, just just have this cigarette. It feels good. Like it'll make you feel better. And then all of a sudden you shift really quickly in the middle of an unconscious habit, an unconscious pattern that you've already created during the middle of that. When it becomes too painful, you then move to something instantaneously pleasurable. And that starts the kickoff of like, okay, if I do this, I feel this way. It's just once again, it's those neurological mm. habits. And then the substance is obviously a kicker. So for those of that, it was alcohol or drugs mm. or sex or porn or um, even just food, mm. it becomes a trigger and then there becomes a cue. Uh, I don't need to step into James's book, but everybody understands that set of patterns. Mm. Um, I think it's really interesting, even though you said that there is no proof that pornography is you know, it can be an addiction, a, a neurological addiction. Um, you know, there is definitely a lot of people in the world these days um, suffering. And when I say suffering is that their personal lives are being impacted by their uncontrollable need to watch or, or read or see pornography all the time. And I see that happening as well with um, a lot of the younger generation, because it's a lot easier, right? There is no, we don't need to see magazines anymore. Everything is on video and it's easy, accessible, and, you know, it's everywhere. So um, I think it's important to, I think, for each person, and I think that's when it comes down to uh, really having that awareness, like at what point enough is enough, right? Like at what point do you go, okay, this is not serving me anymore. I can't keep going on like that. 
So that's very interesting that you bring that up. And I want to, I want to just frame where's the line, where's enough Mm. when it impacts our health, when Mm. it impacts our distortion of reality, when it Mm. impacts our relationships, when it impacts our friendships, when it impacts our even our just our general well-being is i believe when it starts to become an uncontrollable obsession to either gain or give attention to something yeah. or someone so that's like and i want to be really careful because it's not proven however yeah. if you take a look at the world at the moment if you take a look at the access children under the age of 10 have the access through the internet to view more naked women and men doing such an abundance of things that most of the greatest rulers in the world have never had access to. Yeah. Yeah. And at the age of 10 or under, they've got access to it. Like that alone, if that doesn't alert parents to be mindful of what they're watching, to be Mm. mindful, like there is a very fine line between understanding human anatomy for the education of health Mm. versus the the uncontrollable and unreversible impact of that style of nudity to an underage human being. Yeah. And I think, like I said, like at the age of 10, um, you know, I've got a son, he's 11, and a daughter who is nine. Um, and I'm, they are not on social media yet. And we are very, very um, strict on what they watch and, you know, and, and things like that. And, and we explain to them why. You know, I think there is a level of maturity and we will say just like that, that they don't have yet to be exposed to to images and to videos that they could be they could just come across like on YouTube or or whatever these days uh, that, you know, we believe that they they don't have the maturity as yet. And this is the explanation that, you know, we talk about it and we are open about it. Because, and I think we talked about off camera as well uh, yesterday, biological, like there is a difference between a male and a female, you know, like a male, you know, at 11, you know, they get a boost of testosterone and, you know, they, they are, um, you know, where they are at in, in their physical development is very different than where a woman is at. And, and I think that if you start a habit or, or, or get them exposed to a habit like that, such a young age or, 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 or something that becomes a habit, it's very uh, detrimental to their physical, mental and emotional health. Well, I'm going to add to that. That's very beautiful what you said. And I'm going to add to that from some of my areas of, of expertise. And that is, I'm a brain health and professional trainer and coach with Dr. Daniel Amen. Mm-hmm. Very thankful for his knowledge and, and his courses and what I've learned. Yeah. And the addiction reoccurrence, especially from a point of view of where it becomes, where James Clear talks about the cue or where yeah. it's just like, I start to get the craving. And that is majority of that majority. When I say majority based on the studies and the research that happens during a low level of blood sugar in the brain. Mm. Now, why is that important? I want you to think about kids now for a moment, right? Kids need a lot of energy. They, they burn mm. a lot of energy. They need a lot of food. And not only that food, that food needs to be nutritious as yeah. well as they need to get a lot of exercise. And you've got to think about now, and, and, I, and I get really passionate about this because kids in the classroom, boys in the classroom, girls in the classroom are different. And that's from my own experience as well as my own study yeah. in child therapy. So... Mm. When that blood sugar level drops and those children don't get sufficient amount of nutrition, blood flow, oxygen to the brain again, it sends off these triggers of I'm in pain, 
I want pleasure. The last time I got pleasure was doing X. Mm -hmm. So this is extremely, as you can tell, like I'm getting pretty passionate. Yeah. This is extremely important to understand that this not only sets them up for their childhood into teenagehood, yeah. Yeah. this sets them up for young adults. This then sets them up for how they create all of those habits that lead them into positions at work, management roles, leadership roles, and then continues into the leadership space. Because even yeah. this morning, some of the statistics that I was uh, listening to on the Gallup's Thriving podcast was that at the moment, there is more than 60% of global employees that are disconnected from their jobs and more than 18% of those are actually miserable. Yeah, now that all great. stems uh -huh. down, that all stems down all the way back to nutrition, blood flow to the brain, yeah. oxygen, exercise, how their habits were developed as a child. Yeah. And then what are they doing about it now? So I love what you brought up and the most important thing to understand from a children perspective. So just to rein that all in from yeah. a child perspective, that blood sugar level for them in their brain mm -hmm. and oxygen level and exercise is ridiculously important. And that's part of my message to schools, to school kids, to parents, yeah. single parents, especially. Yeah. I mean, I am very passionate about that because I changed my whole family's diet, you know, in my, in my cancer journey. Uh, it, I knew it wasn't enough just to change my diet. So my kids, um, they understand everything about nutrition. I used to like draw to them and I keep going on and on and on about it. So they understand, you know, the connection to their body when they feel, you know, tired or when they eat something that makes them feel, you know, I don't have a lot of energy after I eat this. And, uh, but yes, it is a massive problem because, um, you know, kids, uh, you know, are having major physical health issues at a very young age, you know, obesity, mm -hmm. type 2 diabetes. Uh, and, and that is, it is a lot to do with what they are eating, mm -hmm. right, which is mm -hmm. directly related to their mental health. Mm -hmm. um, I love the work of Dr. Daniel uh, Amen as well. And I think what he's, you know, he, the work that he does is incredible. Mm -hmm. And it's all tied up, it's tied in, isn't it? Like mm -hmm. it's how you look after your physical body, uh, which does have a massive impact on how your mental and emotional, uh, you know, state of mind. And I, and I think that, and I always tell my clients, like if you, you know, it doesn't matter how much, you know, meditation and, mm -hmm. and, and things for your mind mm -hmm. you do, if you're just eating crap and you're not exercising and you're overweight and you're yes. not looking after your body, you know, mm -hmm. we need this body to live in this earth, you know, yes. like it, yes. it's just not going to work. Right. And, and, I, and again, it's back to what we talked earlier about modeling. Yeah. You know, I think the only way to, to change the next generation is to model it differently. And it comes down to mm -hmm. the parents. If as a parent, mm -hmm. you're not exercising and you're eating crab mm -hmm. and you're not looking after yourself and you hate your job and mm -hmm. you come home, mm -hmm. you stress, you know, stress because you hate your job and mm -hmm. how are you setting up them to mm -hmm. create a different life? You know, if there was one way that we could, influence more people to eat healthy other than what already the influence is already doing it's it's that that's going to change the yeah. world it's that yeah and and i'm not talking like and i want to be really respectful to those people out there that choose either to be a vegan or, or vegetarian or carnivore diet or whatever whatever intake of food yeah. you, you choose right the brain itself runs everything yeah and when we understand as an individual our specific brain type even, how our hormones work with different foods that we eat based on our hormone levels. So number one, the brain and how the hormones are produced. Number two, everybody's got a different hormonal level. So therefore knowing your numbers is important. Yeah. And then from that, it's like you base your diet and exercise, even the way you read, even the way you talk, you base that around what, how am I going to increase my level of personal health, 
my personal appearance, my personal image, my self-respect, my self-worth, like all yeah. of that is going to impact that. And it purely comes down to understanding how important it is to eat the right food for our brain type and or even our body and our hormones. Because yeah. if my background is also fitness coaching. Mm -hmm. So I'm a personal trainer by trade, Cert 3, Cert 4 over 65s, under 16s, and pre- and postnatal women. So understanding that to begin with yeah. and, and understanding even a woman's body during cycle as well as mm. during pregnancy, like if women understood this, if men understood how to support their wives, like these are massive topic areas we're talking about. They're extremely yeah. broad. However, this is part of the subjects that I've studied. This is why yeah. I love working with single parents or parents in general to help their children and why that's important. So the question really comes down to is how are we going to influence more people other than what we're doing now? And with massive pharmaceuticals out there and then yeah. massive like <laughs> food companies out there and fast food companies, like we're fighting a challenging battle. Yeah. It's challenging. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, you just, when people have an addiction, like when you think about it, it's like they will do everything to make time for that addiction, right? And, and you know, that could be cutting down on the time that they, you know, could exercise. Now, I always tell, again, I always tell my kids, okay, so, uh, you know, there are, you know, they, they found this thing on TV that was like, a TV show looking at cats that are really cute and dogs. And I said, look, this is great and it makes you feel good. But the reality is a lot of people will be watching this program for two hours and they will finish watching this and they will think to themselves, I wish I had gone for a walk. I wish I had prepared myself a, a healthy meal. Now I'm going to have to get a takeaway. I wish I had done a meditation. I wish I had read a book. And they've just wasted two hours of their life. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. and and I ex I explain it like this to my kids, and and I'm what I'm trying to say to them is that you know you, we all have a limited amount of time, and you need to choose mm -hmm. what you're gonna do, you know, with the time that you have. And looking after our bodies, you know, in our house is a must. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it comes first. But I also know that um, when I didn't do that, uh, it was because I didn't love myself, and I think mm -hmm. that's. You know, a, a thing that it's hard to 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 say it out loud, right? Like people don't want to say that. You know, people is is much easier to say, but I don't have time. But my job is really stressful, mm -hmm. or or you know, I've got kids and I work full time and and all of that. But the reality is, when you are, you know, creating uh, a different life for yourself, you know, looking after yourself, it's a must. I mean, you can't run run away from it you know like it's it, it is the foundation of building a stable house this is a, an area that i really love to talk about especially when i'm when i'm working with my clients as a one-on-one -on -one private therapist and consultant and advisor and mentor with my one-on-one -on -one clients whenever that that this type of topic comes up my words become very simple and that is that the person whether it's the person in front of them or the person they're talking about or whatever it may be, they don't understand the depth or the essence behind understanding the payoffs versus the costs, mm. period. They don't prioritize. It's not a level of commitment. They're not in alignment with what they want to become. They don't yeah. have the tools. They don't have the access. Well, sorry, they don't have the tools and they don't have the, the level of awareness yeah. to actually use their mindset to the advantage. Now, I love some of the videos. Some of the videos that I've created in the last sort of couple of weeks have been about mindset. Mindset is a broad topic. Now, one yeah. of the things that I dislike about the buzzword of mindset being thrown around is that if you've never been through struggle, adversity, addiction, conflict, <laughs> or even challenges, you do not have a strong mindset. And yeah. not until you face that, not until you do some personal reflection on what actually got you to where you are today, hmm. you will not understand actually how to grow a strong mindset. Yeah. You must be challenged. So that brings me 
to three things that I want to share with the audience to give them an, eyes, an, an understanding of why you complain about working too much, why you blame time, why you blame your partner, your parents, your children, or anything else, even money. And that is because you must be willing to look at how you got from where you were as a child to where you are now. Mm. You must know where you want to go and you yeah. must know who are you going to surround yourself or ask the questions to then get you there. Yeah. And all of during all of that, you're going to be faced with adversity, mm. tragedy. Yeah, it's struggle, not going to be linear pain. like that. <laughs> exactly. And it's not until you do that, it's not until yeah. you do that, you won't have the mindset to project you in yeah. the ear towards the congruency of where you want to go. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's so important that you bring up because when I started my business, I thought I could shake people up before the crisis, you know, like that old version of myself that was like running ragged, you know, like working herself like to her deathbed and, you know, trying to be perfect and thinking she was doing everything right. And I thought, no, maybe I can help that person, but that person cannot be helped because that person uh, is not aware of where they are at and, and that person is not prepared to see, you know, what happened between their childhood to now to, to, to let, you know, to get to that place. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, unfortunately it does take us to, to, to really hit a point where we're like, enough is enough. And I think, you know, when we talk about addiction, I think it's so easy these days to be hooked into something to give us that pleasure that you were talking about, isn't it? Like that trigger, like, oh, I feel like shit today. Okay, well, I'm just going to eat sugar or I'm just going to drink alcohol. I had a bad day. Let me, you know, just kind of console myself by drinking, you know, six beers and two bottles of wine with my partner. You know, I used to do that, you know, and eat salami and cheese all night with crisps and God knows what else. You know, there's it's there's so many things. Now let's I'm gonna just scroll on, on social media, you know, for two hours. I'm just gonna watch TV shows that are, you know, mind numbing. I'm just going to watch porn. I'm just going to, you know, you know, use drugs. Literally the world is there. You can choose from which which addiction do you want to pick? What's what I love about what you just said. Everything we do is formed of a set of patterns and habits. Mm. Now, the addiction part is the uncontrollable obsession to do it. Okay. Majority of that, based on the studies that actually have proven, that's based on blood sugar level dropping. Mm -hmm. And then this sense of whether it's a dopamine spike, a serotonin spike, an oxytocin spike, or even a melatonin spike, mm. endorphins, neuropinephrine, all of those things that one of the greatest people I love listening to is Andrew Huberman. All of these things that they talk about. Yeah. Everything that we're doing is a set of patterns and a set of habits. Now, self-sabotage, mm. creating our own narrative, following the narrative, that I believe is an addiction pattern. It's an addictive yes. pattern. <laughs> yes. Imposter syndrome. It's a set of patterns. It's an addictive yeah. pattern. Yeah. Um, another one, procrastination. It's yeah. a set of addictive patterns. Yeah. Anger. It's a set of addictive patterns. Sadness. Empathy. Guilt. Narcissism. Yeah. Guilt. Yeah. Shame. Yeah. All of these things are a set of patterns, a set of habits that we have created to either protect ourselves or mask from others knowing what's really going on. Yeah. In, in my book that I'm currently writing, the first chapter and the opening chapter is called Unearth the Truth Behind the Lies That You've Been Telling Yourself. Mm. Now, yeah. just think about that. Yeah. Just think about that for a moment. I, I plead with the audience, if you're listening, how many times a day do you lie to yourself? But truly, yeah. this is not a place that I want you to reflect and feel bad. This is a place where I want you to reflect and think, yeah. Oh my God, I do. I said I was going to go to the gym this morning at 6 a.m. and I pressed the snooze button. I didn't go. Yeah. You just lied to yourself. You didn't follow through. You're not mm -hmm. in alignment. You're not being your word. 
Like how yeah. many times are we going to continuously practice that? Because then when we're questioned and we're not questioned to look like a fool, we're questioned because someone wants to help us. Mm. We feel foolish then to respond in a way that it's like, yeah, I, I did. I ate the donut and it's just like, great. So tomorrow I just don't eat the donut. Yeah. Oh, but it's so hard. It's like this. And it's like, no, you, no, it's just a set of patterns that you've got to break. So I yeah. just, I, I want the audience to think about this, to reflect mm -hmm. on themselves. It's like, where can I start on myself? In other words, put your mask on first. Are you yeah, truly sure. in alignment? Are you truly in alignment with what you're trying to achieve? Are mm -hmm. you truly committed to living and leading an, an exceptional life? And mm -hmm. Whereabouts do you actually need to fine tune your mindset so that you're able to capture yourself in these moments so that you can yes. be, so that you can be Changed a apart. demonstration? Yeah, exactly. yeah. Just, yes. Yeah. Yes, just think, be an example for the world. Yeah, I think what you said is so uh, powerful because I have worked with a lot of people that have gone to, uh, you know, psychologists for years on end. You know, they talk about, you know, what happened in their childhood, the traumas, which I think is very, very important. But at the end of the day, by the time you have created those patterns and habits, talking about it is part of it. Mm -hmm. But until you start taking different action, nothing is going to change, right? Nothing. So you can talk about, you know, I started self-sabotaging when I was, you know, this age and I've always done it. Yeah, okay, we understand that and we, you, it's important to work through that and uncover and, and talk about that. But then from tomorrow on, if you didn't go to the gym today, you just, just get up and go to the gym, you know, like, and it's, and I think that's where most people struggle with. They are looking for that. Well, but wait a second, I'm going to listen to something else. I'm going to read another book. I'm going to. So I can get that one thing that is going to make me change. Well, nothing is going to make change. You need to make yourself change, right? And that is what the issue is for most people. You know, that until you actually move this body here and take the action to change, nothing is going to change. You can't just change in your mind either. You I'm can't not, create a muscly body in your mind yeah, not going to the no. gym. Once you know, again, <laughs> once again, I like, I love what you're sharing and I'm, and I'm going to add, I'm going to add once again, just a piece of that, which is people don't like change for a few reasons. One of them that I want to share is because they're trying to change the wrong thing. <laughs> they're trying to change the wrong thing. Like now, your partner. <laughs> like, yeah, they're trying to change either the other person or they're trying to change uh, yeah. the channel that they watch or they're trying to change the addiction habit they've got. They're just trying to change something. They're even moving around their environment, like procrastination, for example. Let me just use this for an example, right? P so many people are now are turning around and saying they're ADHD because they've got lack of concentration. No, you don't have ADHD because you've got a lack of concentration. You've got made up fake diagnosis because you read something on the internet a human is multiple, they do multiple things at once. Yeah. If I'm walking from this room to another room, I'll pick up something and go and put it there. Multiple people do this on a different occasion. You're not, yeah. you don't get distracted in another room. You've got a lack of concentration. It's got nothing to do with ADHD. Nothing. You just don't yeah. have a lack of concentration. Now, can you blame it? Can you give it? I've got the DSM. I use the DSM. I, I understand why it's important to have the DSM. However, mm -hmm. If you look at the daily habits of even uh, an animal, you can start to see distinctive patterns where they walk. We get that, right? But when you look at a human, they do the same thing consistently. It's, it yeah. comes down to the same thing. So that's one thing. They start to change the wrong thing. Mm. One of the other things that I want to bring up is this, is that when we change one thing, if we manage to change one thing, the hardest and most dangerous part of that is the overwhelm and almost a level of depression that that can create or the spiral in thoughts because if that was one thing was so easy to change, why didn't I do that years ago? Mm. So that's another reason that is so important to understand when it comes yeah. to I don't want to change because if I realize how easy it is to change, that person actually questions their entire life. Yeah. 
And that alone can send someone into a spiral. Yeah. Yeah, because it is really the letting go process of, uh, you know, and you talked about the, you know, the, the patterns, you know, the, you mentioned anger. I was addicted to anger. It was my pattern. And my coping mechanism was drinking alcohol. So mm -hmm. I had an unhealthy relationship with alcohol. You could say I was, you know, borderline an alcoholic, but like, you know, what's the definition of alcohol, an alcoholic, you know, unless you're living on the street and you lost everything they own, people don't classify you as an alcoholic. But the reality is, you know, if you have an unhealthy relationship is, you know, it's, it, you have to, to be honest with yourself and say, you know what, I don't have, I can't, I, I still don't think I can drink alcohol and being in a healthy relationship with alcohol. That was the, the lie that I created to myself. You know, oh, I'm angry because, you know, there is plenty of childhood stories about it. Uh, but, you know, and, and, but the pattern was always going, coming back to the anger and the coping mechanism always to, um, to drink alcohol. But once I had to let go of that person, like you said, it was like, wow, like, I did spend so many years angry. I said. Yeah. And this is part of just once again, it's just part of the pattern. And the more that, the more that you talk, the more that you explain the stories, the more that you tell out loud the narrative of why you do stuff, the more you understand the patterns, the more that you're able to face them, the more that you're able to yeah. then grow and then increase your level of self-awareness to the patterns that's going on around you. Now, yeah. this, is, this is also detrimental when we become too hyper-conscious. Because if you become so hyper-conscious to what you're doing all the time, you're never actually going to get into what we call a flow state, which yeah. is a flow state of enjoyment and love and excitement yeah. when you're around a group of people. You actually become hyper-conscious, which means, or or in, in the use of the terminology that I'm using it now, you're just going to become conscious to the point of where you psychoanalyze your environment. You're able to actually be unable to be in the moment. There's a difference between being in the moment and present. Yeah. Being in the moment is more of a flow state. Being present is conscious and awareness. When you're yeah. actually too conscious and, and hyper aware of your environment, you psychoanalyze what other people say. You then super, you then internally reflect and can get social anx socially anxious. Yeah. So it, worth, it works both ways. Personal development alone can also be detrimental when overdone. Yes. It can yes. be overdone. So yes. this this level of importance about what we're talking about. It's like, what are you addicted to? Like, it's not until you talk to somebody in a way that they give you space to talk about that stuff yeah. where you're able to become aware through challenges and conversation and a level of conflict so that you can become aware of those habits. Yeah. Now, the next, the next part of that is... What I really want to outline, that's why I like to work with those high performers that are up there that have got those addictions that are just hiding under the surface. Mm. And the addiction is not the ultimate problem. The mm -hmm. addiction is the life that the addiction denies you from living. Yes. Yeah. So... Yeah, so many important things here that you've said. And, um, and you know, when you talk about the high performance that are addicted, and again, it could be addiction to so many things. And we talked off camera, I know you've, you know, talked about, you know, working with senior executives that are addicted to pornography, you know, like it could be addicted to food, alcohol, you cocaine. know, there is so cocaine many. Cocaine is a big one. Cocaine, word. you know, like there is so many Strippers, things gambling. that. gambling. Yeah, gambling, you know, that's. Um, there was so much shame that comes with that as well, isn't it? The, the, yeah. So here's, here's a very important one that I want to share. And that is, I want you to think about the, the good person over here versus the unhealthy over here, the healthy versus the unhealthy. The healthy coping mechanism is for the high performance to turn up to a charity event, is to turn up to a charity event, give the money, donate the money to the charity event, 
And then the unhealthy coping mechanism is to stay out with their friends majority of the time while the wives go home. And these people over here are going to either the strip club, gambling, or doing cocaine. Now, I know that for a fact. I have heard it from the words of so many executives. These are the ones that I help. Mm. Them ones. It's a safe space. It's private. But mm. that's that's the... That's the angst. That's the healthy coping mechanism over here. And here's the unhealthy one over here. And I did that for so many years. I recognize it. I understand yes. it. High functioning cocaine addicts are the ones that literally go to work, right? Yeah. And some of the things that you'll see is they will have uh, addictive patterns and you'll see it at work. Mm. You'll see it at work. You'll see that they, they make excuses for other people, but they don't, expo they don't, they don't come down on the people that are actually doing the wrong thing yes, because they're not in that environment. That person, just because they've got a high opinion of drugs, they will use that against that person underlyingly. It's all in the language. It's all in the narrative. It's all in the unconscious behavior. That's what it is. And, and like you said, until you work with somebody that can pinpoint your, you know, shed light into your darkness, mm -hmm. you don't realize that, mm -hmm. you know, the actual, you know, going to the street, but it's just a coping mechanism and doing the cocaine. But it's the what's sitting underlying that you need to work through, right? It's not yep. just it's not just yep. stopping the physical habit, but 100%. it's just un uncovering the yeah, that's that's very, very mm. powerful as well. Um, mm. so how can people reach out to you? Like uh, how can people reach out to for you to help them to I mm -hmm. think that's you know the work that you're doing is very important. I don't think it's uh people are very hesitant about speaking even about the you know pornography addiction and i think there were so many uh you know and i dare to say males that are addicted to it because uh you know it is the biological and the you know the the tendencies and you know they're made differently than women and i'm you know very happy to again to say that um and there were so many people that have so much shame and they don't want to ask for help i mean what you know, before you kind of said, what would you say to that person that is sitting there thinking like, I know I, I need help, but I feel so much shame and I don't even know where to start. What we are here to learn is what we're here to teach. I've lived the experience. So if you're sitting there in the audience right now and you're listening, just going, I think he's talking to me, it's because I am. And it's a safe space. I've been there. I've felt it. I've done it. I've gone through it. I've walked through hell. Mm. However, you are a product of your environment. So where you do one thing in your life is where you do everything in your life. Yeah. So where are you holding? You're only hindering your level of exceptionality. You can be an exceptional human more and over and above than what you already are or yeah. what you believe you already are. It's what it's hindering you from having. Yeah. Being, doing, living mm -hmm. with family, without yeah. family. Yeah. Yeah. That's very important. Yeah. So, how can pe people reach out to you? Okay. So, people can reach out to me on LinkedIn, private message on LinkedIn. They can reach out to me on my link tree. I've got a 30 minute free consultation that's available. Just jump on the link tree. Instagram threads twitter uh, i think there's a tiktok account uh there's youtube you can follow me on youtube uh but the main thing is is obviously like i've got i've got my book that i recovered that i used called captured emotions i've got a you know it's a best-selling book on amazon i've also got journals that i've published uh one of them is called the resilience journal which is now called three a day um to happiness and there's also this little guy which uh, it's it's a flip book about optimism and how to you know change the tune in your head. Um, on the twelfth of August, I'll be in Sydney uh, releasing this book at the New South Wales Amazing. State Library, so you can catch me there in Sydney on the twelfth. Um, where else uh, can you reach out to me? You can just reach out to me on my phone number on WhatsApp. Uh, get hold of me there. Write an email to me. Um, Amazing. I'll add all your details. Everywhere. Yeah, I would add your details uh, down uh, your social so people can reach out to you. 
Thank you so much for sharing your personal story and um, you know your learnings as well. Uh, I think we can learn so much from each other's experience, and it's so powerful. Um, you know, part of me think, thinks that, and until you go through it, you have so much more power to teach somebody when you are on the other side and you have conquered mm -hmm. and mastered something that they are trying to conquer, right? Mm -hmm. uh, because you have walked on their shoes. So I think that's very, very powerful. Mm. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much as well, Angelica. I really Thanks. appreciate the time and your audience.